of the Tiverton Town Council, Tuesday, October 15, 2013. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk. Councilor Gulak. Present. Councilor Ruda. Present. Councilor Shabbat. Present. Councilor Broderick. Present. Councilor Pelletier. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Councilor De Medeiros and Councilor Lambert are absent. Okay. Uh, the consent agenda. Approval of the minutes of regular council meetings September 23rd, 2013. Approval of executive session minutes September 23rd, 2013. Approval of joint workshop minutes September 30th, 2013. Councilor Gerlach and Councilor Ruder abstained absent. Receipt of minutes for the following board's commissions. Arts Council, Economic Development Commission, Historic Preservation Advisory Board 2, Planning Board, Prevention Coalition, Wastewater Management Commission 2, Zoning Board of Review. Correspondence received and filed. Barbara Pelletier, September meeting minutes of the Newport County Visitors Bureau. Approval of tax assessor's abatements. Kate Nishad, Planning Board Administrative Officer, September Activities Report. Distribution of Town Administ Administrator's September Report. Chief Thomas Blakely, permission to advertise for position of police officer. Denise Sorrell, Treasurer, August and September monthly budget and revenue reports. Is there anything that uh, the Council wishes to remove? Yes, Mr. Roger, I'd like to remove uh, CA7. CA7. Okay. Anything else? Then I will entertain a motion regarding the rest of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Yes, sir. Well, this is a simple question on the position for the police officer being advertised. Would that put them in an academy, or is it looking actually for an already existing person who is an officer? We're looking to establish a list. Is that to put someone in, a, in an academy or? Not necessarily. Okay. If we, if we see a vacancy coming, we may try to get one in. Okay. The next academy begins in January. They're only twice a year, July and January. So, you know, you have to have a candidate ready <laughs> if you're going to lose an officer. All right. But this doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hire an officer. I just, is this going to get qualification? I mean, that's how it works. If we were going to hire an officer, we wouldn't be doing it like this. We'd be coming straight forward to the council. All right, thank you. Okay. I will entertain a motion on CA7. Move that we uh, approve CA7 permission to advertise for position of police officer. Second. We have a motion second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, open forum announcements, comments, and questions. Uh, Donna Cook. Good evening. I just had a question on uh, the seaside uh, gas station and how that was handled. Um, uh, Ms. Cook. Yes. Okay. In, in this in this forum, you can make comments. We cannot um, comment on okay. them, though. Okay. Fair so enough. you can. I'll say what say, I have say to what say. you want to say. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to uh, bring to your attention that I didn't uh, quite understand what the acquisition for real property was in the closed session and then to find out from the newspaper what it was about. Also, the way it was presented by uh, uh, East Bay, Rhode Island was a cryptic remark before you went into the closed session by you. Council, um, Councilman Roderick, cryptic means, like I had pointed out before, you seem angry. Um, also, I looked up open meeting laws because of the, the numbers given here. Why this wasn't discussed to put on the agenda so that people could even know what the acquisition was is beyond me. But it does say that under the open meetings law that you may hold the meetings closed under these circumstances, <coughs> which means that you also can decide not to. 
So I'm just wondering why that couldn't have been in an open forum when it's taxpayer money or if it's going to be some other type of money, what's the secret? It's not good to do things like that in a democratic process all in, in secret all the time, and I'm very much against it. And also, during uh, the candidate, Tibbet and First candidates, your statements here said that you'd put Tibbet in before individual agendas and seek compromise educate voters about the facts and true choices facing them, which we were not allowed to know because it was done in closed session, and encourage respectful open discussion, which wasn't done, of issues instead of late night closed sessions, and you're either with us or against us. Well, you're certainly not keeping your promise on that. And I want it changed. I want, we're not three-year-olds here. We're all paying a lot of money to be in this Tiverton, Town of Tiverton Club, which costs a lot of money, probably $3,500 a year for us to belong to this club. So I would like it to be, I, I'm not understanding why that couldn't have been. Look, you know, it's an eyesore. I'd like it gone myself. But I just don't like the way it was done. I don't think it was necessary. Now, if you wanted to then discuss how much it was going to cost or where the money was going to come from, I think it could have been open. If you wanted to do like the contract or something, I think you should have, you could have said that it's not, it, it, we are using a grant or something like that. I mean, I, I'm just not understanding why it has to be that way. And I think Council Pel Councilman Pelletier uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, tried to ask why we're doing everything more and more in, in closed session and uh, he really got nowhere with it, as I recall. And I have to uh, commend him for bringing that up. And I, I would like it stopped. I don't think, personally, we're not a law firm. We're people that pay our taxes. And we want to know what's going on. And every time, we don't know how you're voting either. So how do you make a decision when you're voting, like how someone's voting? It's closed. The votes are closed. I don't know who voted for what. I don't know if someone disagreed with how it was done. And I want it stopped. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Pelletier. Uh, Barbara Pelletier. Um, I think at the last meeting we brought up the Halloween party, and I just got feedback that probably not this year, but the school committee was some, some of the favor of the talking about it at least for next year? They're having it on the school grounds. On the school grounds. So I don't know if anybody wants to take up the momentum and try to get anything going for this year, because it only leaves us a few, two weeks or so. Um, on the other item that I'd like to um, touch on is the dog park. And if the situation with na the national grid and the land near the park and ride doesn't work out. I had that thought and I had, and I don't really know where we stand on that uh, proposed staging area for a disaster at the dump. But uh, since that's gonna be an enclosed area, is there a possibility of tying it to that? Um, because we might need mulch or so to replenish the flooring or the, co the ground cover at a dog park. And it, we do have ground up Christmas trees at the dump that would be a ready access for materials. Plus there's water there at the restrooms for replenishing water bowls and all of that. And in addition, a lot of people do use the um, athletic fields. And while some people do their athletic things, other people and the family can walk their dog or something like that. And it was just a thought that before maybe that opportunity is lost, we could at least look into it. Uh, it was a thought. We seem to be immensely popular also with the bicyclists. Everybody rides a bicycle in Tibetan. 
which gave me the idea because I read in the paper that Providence is actually going to follow the lead of some of your like European cities like Amsterdam and Heidelberg and any number of cities where there are free bicycles at places around town where you can just hop on a bicycle, do your bicycle thing, and then leave it <coughs> somewhere. And if Tiverton had that, it might attract some people because some people visiting people here don't necessarily put their bike on a bike rack and travel with it. But once here they see this wonderful opportunity, they could hop on a bicycle and, and do their thing. And I wonder, and I do believe in the best qualities of people, that people wouldn't just rip off these bicycles, but that we could try something like that. And I suppose it would be with the Recreation Commission, and I don't know where we would stage it, and I don't know if there would be any liability <coughs> or if the town putting a sign on it, no, we're not liable for your falling off your bicycle would do it. <laughs> but I wondered if bringing it out in the open like here, at least somebody else could think about it, or at least the idea is there and you could float it around because it would make us quite unique in this area to have free bicycles. Just hop on and hop off. I, I mean, what does it sound like to you? Or don't you give feedback? No, you don't give feedback. Well, technically, we can. No, all right, technically you can't. And the other thing which I think might be a gold mine for us is I think it was the province business news or somewhere I read that some communities, and Central Falls has done that, is if they can't fund a project when Central Falls was emerging from bankruptcy, they needed uh, containers for their trash bins, um, decorative con holders for their trash bins. They had no money, so they set up a website where people could donate public donations. And I suppose a town is tax exempt. I, is it? And and you were know, you're a law, you were the lawyer for Central Falls, weren't you? So maybe you you would know about the collecting, how to set up a thing like that. But they set up a fund online where people could donate, and they collected enough money to then commission the people in the foundry in Providence that were actually artists to do artistic waste baskets for uh, trash barrel covers. So to me, it was a truly a win-win because it gave a showcase for, they got their trash barrels for free. They uh, got unusual trash barrels. And especially Tiverton, which is such a art gallery kind of community, it, it might just work. And it, it was a thought that I would like you guys to please entertain and uh, might go someplace. But I think, I think the thing to do is not just to have ideas and say, I think we should just embrace some of these ideas and run with it. And I mean, we're all getting older. I know longevity has increased, but if we don't move, we'll be dead before some of these things can happen. And let's not push our locks on this planet. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Uh, celebrate Tivin in 2014, Linda Larson, Huck Little. I'm Linda Larson. Um, just as we, we placed on the agenda, um, we're just coming before you to let you know that we are starting the process of doing some preliminary investigations of seeing if it, there is a possibility of adding fireworks to the Celebrate Tivit in 2014 festival. So our conversations have been very preliminary at this point. We've had some very brief conversations with Chief Blakey as well as Chief Lloyd. Um, some obvious concerns right up front. Um, we would definitely follow the path as we would for any of the other events throughout the festival, a proper permitting, license, health and safety, so forth and so on. Um, we haven't gone before the rec committee. We don't really have a location. We're looking at some different things, whether it's a barge and the cost of that and so forth and so on. So this is just kind of to put you on notice that before you hear it somewhere that we're doing something or I receive a phone call or <laughs> whatever, that, that we are in the preliminary stages, but we would obviously follow all proper procedures as we did last year. So my uh, 
my friend Huck Little here. Um, <laughs> uh, he, uh, as uh, being a small business owner of, of Little Bear, um, he kind of reached out and had an idea and wanted to um, give back to the community. And actually, it was uh, Miss Mello that kind of put us in touch with each other. Um, and he's going to do some fundraising to kind of start the ball rolling for this and hopefully. I mean, it, it's starting somewhere. So on October 26th, there will be a nine-hole scramble at Green Valley Country Club. It's at 1 o'clock. It's $50. So you play nine holes in a scramble. You come back to Little Bear. You get a meal and two drink tickets. Um, he's also looking for sponsors for each hole. So this is going to kind of be the first event as he's putting on as a small business owner um, in town to kind of start the ball rolling and, uh, and start collecting some funds um, that will be designated strictly for, for fireworks at the festival. Um, there'll be a couple of spaghetti dinners um, that he's going to put on at Little Bear as well. I don't have dates or times uh, of that, but we'll obviously make you aware. Um, and then at that point, we're going to start going out to businesses economic development so forth and so on and reaching out into the community um, to see if there's uh, any interest to support the addition of because of the large cost associated with just the display itself the possibility <coughs> of the barge um, and then any extra details that we're going to have to uh, you know accumulate mm -hmm. that we didn't have last year that we'll have to pay for right thank you that's it thank you a public hearings and public presentation. Public hearing on proposed amendment to Article 5, Section 1, Note 1 of the Zoning Ordinance to include open space zones requested by the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Uh, also, a planning board recommendation. Good evening. I'm Lauren Staffed. I'm Audubon Society of Rhode Island's Executive Director. And I'm Seth Handy of Handy Law. I'm counsel to the Audubon Society. Okay. Thank you for uh, uh, allowing us to come before you this evening. Uh, simply put, Audubon uh, is requesting to amend Article 5, Section 1, Note 1 of the Tiverton Zoning Ordinance to include open spaces. Uh, open space zones, excuse me. Uh, Audubon Society owns the Emily Reeker Wildlife Refuge, uh, about 40 acres on uh, Seapoet Avenue in, in Tiverton, and uh, it is an open space zone with pre-existing with a pre-existing house on it. Um, Audubon has resolved to divest itself of, of houses because it's not really central to its mission to rent houses to people, so it would prefer to raise the money to buy more property to preserve uh, habitat for birds and wildlife, and uh, <coughs> so it investigated the process of divesting itself of this house, and that would require a subdivision. Uh, they, they approached the town about a subdivision, we approached the town and, and the town indicated that one problem was that uh, the subdivision requires proof that the subdivided parcel will comply with all zoning restrictions, um, setbacks, etc. Uh, obviously in a case where there's a house on a, on an op uh, it's, it's an anomaly to have a house on an open space, in an open space zone, uh, so that the zoning restrictions don't apply to open space and so therefore uh, the planning department couldn't tell whether this property comply will comply with zoning restrictions or not so we're seeking to amend uh, this provision of the zoning law that basically says that uh, <coughs> residences in a in zo certain zones uh, uh, are subject to the dimensional regulations of the nearest residential district uh, we're just seeking to amend that to add open space zones in there so that uh, we can apply a uh, set of zoning criteria to this property and, and uh, the planning department can determine whether it uh, is compliant and, and, uh, in order to grant a subdivision. This, this proposal fundamentally benefits the town uh, because of two things. Number one, if the house is uh, 
is sold into private ownership, it will be subject to taxation and, and therefore there will be an increased tax revenue to the town. But at the same time, it will not allow for any change in the existing residence. There's no, there's no change permitted to an, uh, a, on a pre-existing house in an open space zone. So there's no potential for this change to, to uh, uh, affect more development on this piece of property. It's going to be the same. This house will remain the same forever. So, so we're just seeking to make a simple amendment in order to allow Audubon to go ahead with the subdivision and sell the property. Uh, Mr. President, if I may add to that, uh, the planning board unanimously supports this and they have indicated that this is the only open space property in our community that has a house on it. Thank you. Uh, how, how large will the property be that includes the house? Well, the uh, Rucker Refuge is 40 acres in size. Mm -hmm. um, the house currently, I'm sorry, the entire Re Rucker Refuge is 50 acres in si size if you also include that section called Jack's Island across the uh, mm -hmm. right away. Um, the house itself sits on a 30 acre lot. <coughs> what we're proposing to do is to carve off a, I'm, I'm thinking an R80 lot around mm -hmm. the house because that is what is the closest residential size lot in the area and to merge other lots within the refuge so we're actually one not creating any additional lots we're simply seeking administrative subdivision to create a lot but erase other lots so it'd be 80,000 square feet I believe is what the nearest zone would be mm -hmm. so that that really would allow for the, the house the barn that's there and a uh, room for a septic system and well <coughs> and the entire rest of the refuge of course would remain um, as a public open space where people hike the refuge and mm -hmm. look at the birds great okay. uh, mr. tights um, I don't really have much to add um, I have reviewed this beforehand obviously and I support it as well it's a simple I think dealing more with an oversight as indicated when the ordinance was written people didn't think we had any residences in open space zones um, so there was no provision this obviously makes sense the nearest open space zone um, and as indicated um, by the town administrator um, there was a research project a research you know, project done by the uh, administrative officer Kate Michaud to look at all the other open space parcels and um, most of them have nothing on it at all there's a pumping station on one and beaches on the other but this is the only one with a residence so it's not likely to open the floodgates to anything okay. so I would support it as well okay. anything from the council yeah I just have one quick quick question and maybe Andy can answer this if there's no provision for um, dimensional requirements in an open space zone why is it not just by default no zoning or no requirement to have a dimensional um, proof of burden so to speak why wouldn't it not be just there are no regulations therefore we acknowledge there are no regulations and your subdivision can be however it wants to be well I, I would consider that not a, a good outcome to, to say you know you could take this house in the middle of an you know open space on one side and an R80 on the other side and make this a 10,000 square foot lot um, the whole scheme that's set up there for the rest of the ordinance is to try to make it compatible so if you've got a residence in another zone that otherwise wouldn't have it says you go go to the nearest residential zone so it'll be compatible so I think um, as a default it's certainly better to go to the nearest residential zone than to say that there's no zoning at all um, so my interpretation I, I of it agree I wouldn't disagree that that's it's more well, and, and my <coughs> interpretation is without it they're just not permitted it's non-conforming it would be an intensification of the non-conforming use if they tried to subdivide this residence down to a smaller parcel okay. which would require a variance from the zoning board um, and that was presented as a possibility and, and this was the route that they chose and I think this is a cleaner route than going to have a variance okay. for the town. 
Good answer. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> um, else? Just a really quick question. I, I, I've been to Emily Rucker's on many an occasion, but I'm having trouble kind of envisioning this house. It, this isn't. Exactly. This isn't. <laughs> That's the point. This um, isn't currently occupied. Is yes, it is occupied. Oh, it it's is. occupied by an employee of Audubon. It's a little white farmhouse right on Sabawat Road across from Hathaway Farm. You can go further and from the parking lot, there's a little house before you come to the bend in the road. Okay. Most people don't even associate that house with the refuge. They just assume that it's a privately owned house next door. Um, we would like it to be a privately owned house <laughs> next door <laughs> rather than maintaining it. And, and to add to Mr. Tights's point, directly across the street on Sapawat Road is an R80 zone. So someday there will be two acre lots up and down Sapawat Road across the street. This would just be one on the north side of the street. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Okay. And Andy, I think this will also help us in the future should we acquire other open space that may have a house. I exactly, yeah. yes. All right, if there's nothing else from the council. The public. Oh, the public hearing. Anything from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, the hearing is now closed on that issue. I will entertain a motion. I would move that we uh, approve the proposed amendment to Article 5, Section 1, Note 1 of the Zoning Ordinance to include open space zones as requested by the Audubon Society of Rhode Island, included in our packet B1 and B1A. Second. We have a motion and second. Yes, Mr. Tights. Um, could I also ask that the Council um, adopt the Planning Board's recommendation uh, as your finding of fact as well? Yes, and also to adopt the Planning Board's recommendation uh, B1A as our finding of fact. Period. Second. Okay. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Continuing at the public hearing. Public hearing on proposed ordinance amendment, chapter 47, foreclosed and vacant properties. A town, sol town solicitor's proposed further amendments for presentation at public hearing. Okay. Yes, you can start. I guess I'll, I'll, guess I'll start. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I was asked by the uh, town administrator to um, prepare an ordinance um, to try to deal with some of the issues we have in the town of um, foreclosed properties and uh, vacant properties of both commercial and residential um, where they're not be being taken care of. Um, the concern is that these properties um, not just um, don't look good on themselves, but they form a blight on the neighborhood. The commercial properties, they discourage other commercial investment around them if they're unkempt. Um, and the same thing on the residential properties, they discourage uh, investment in taking care of properties and sometimes get to the stage where we have issues with uh, rodents or things like that. Now, we do have various things under the health code that we can deal with with the rodents, but we want to try to take a little more proactive stance so that we could move quicker on um, getting things um, kept up with the town and not let things deteriorate. <coughs> and one of the big problems was um, finding out who the people are, tracking down who the owners of the property are sometimes, and having a little leverage on them. Um, you, you have in front of you um, actually B2 and B2A, um, which is just slightly changed. There was a, a cross-reference that was taken out that was corrected on page 2. Underboarded. Hmm? Underboarded. Underboarded, right. Mm -hmm. um, and under page, uh, page 4, there's a typo and also changing... Um, we had a requirement the property must be expected once every seven days, and I changed that to 14 days. Seven days seemed to be a little bit too strict. Okay. Anyone from the public? Mr. Bettis?
I have uh, several comments that I documented in a cover letter and in a uh, proposed revision to the ordinance, which I included as a uh, track changes document, which uh, carefully enumerates all of the problems in the proposed ordinance. Uh, the proposed vacant property ordinance is desperately needed in Tiverton to protect the property owners from the problems that are directly and or indirectly caused by the vacant properties. However, the proposed ordinance has been poorly written and as written will create many more problems than it corrects. Vacant property ordinances should be carefully crafted to protect the people in Tiverton by carefully avoiding the causes and the root causes of the problems associated with the vacant properties while avoiding any avoidable violation, direct or indirect, as well as intended and unintended of the, proper, of the personal and property rights of individuals. The ordinance as written does not accomplish that task and I believe that my comments and requested changes will correct that. First, the ordinance must, to the maximum extent practicable, carefully exclude the property of people who are on vacation and or on business trips and or away on personal business. That does not mean that it should ignore property that is totally abandoned for a winter in Florida. My requested changes address that issue. Second, the ordinance must not be used to craft a separate set of maintenance requirements for homes and yards, and it must not give any Tiverton official the authority to use and or abuse the ordinance to impose a set of maintenance requirements for homes and yards. Therefore, requirements must be carefully crafted to adequately define requirements and not be left subjective for the interpretation of others. In order to accomplish this, any maintenance requirements for vacant properties must be loose enough to avoid creating a set of maintenance requirements for vacant homes that is strictly than, stricter than for occupied homes. Words like overgrown vegetation without carefully added descriptions must be avoided. Descriptions such as overgrown vegetation that covers the sidewalk or walkway to the door must be added. It should be assumed that a separate ordinance for acceptable property and yard maintenance is in existence or will soon be written to protect neighboring properties from property devaluation <coughs> and or safety problems such as trees and bushes blocking sidewalks and or blocking the view at corners and driveways. Now, I have a, a marked up document here that I presented that you should have copies of. To start with, it, the title should not be uh, foreclosed and vacant because that the word and means both. You need to use the words and slash or to be what writers and engineers refer to as the inclusive or. So that it, inc it includes either one or the other or both. Also, uh, if, you, as you, if you look at the first page, I have capitalized all of the items that are in uh, section 47-2 under definitions. Because uncapitalized, when you put a definition in there for use in this document, you have to identify that it's for use in this document by using caps. If you don't use caps, then people are justified in ignoring your definition that's in here and going to a standard dictionary. Otherwise, how is somebody to understand the difference between your word property and the definition that you put in here as property? If you go farther down on page one, there's several cases of where property has been capitalized. On page two, under definitions, I spell out the, uh, the uh, comment the definitions must be capitalized. There are 
numerous comments in here indicating the definition of uh, many items uh, basically defines any property that lacks a six foot or higher fence or wall with a block gate is defined as accessible property. Since the term is not used in the entire document, it becomes irrelevant because the term property has not been used. There's several other items in here. In the middle of page two, I've revised the definition of property to add the definition. A property shall not be considered vacant while occupants are absent for a period of 30 days or less in order to accommodate reasonable length vacations and or business trips and or vacations. A property shall not be considered vacant while the occupants are, are absent for a period between 30 and 60 days if reasonable <laughs> attempts. Days. 90 days. It says 90. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mis, so, misreading that. If uh, 30 to 90 days, if reasonable attempts are made to maintain the appearance of an occupied property, actions such as providing for grass maintenance to a length of less than 12 inches, discontinuance of mail, and monitoring of the property on a weekly documented schedule by a designee of the owner. Uh, in the next paragraph, I capitalize property, the same throughout the page, and there's numerous comments in here to document a lot of that. Instead of just saying vacant, it, it should say vacant and unoccupied building in caps means any building and or structure which is nearly occupied nor used by a person by persons authorized by the owner of the property on which such building or structure is located it shall also include any vacant and unoccupied building or structure that is subject to current notice of default notice of trustee sale pending tax assessors lane or any real property conveyed via foreclosure and resulting in the acquisition of title by an interested beneficiary of deed or trust or any property conveyed via deed in lieu of foreclosure sale. Uh, 473, I just capitalized property. 475, capitalized property and owner. Uh, Section 47.6, I revise to state any person, firm, or corporation who is the owner of property who violates the provisions of this code and has served a notice of violation is guilty of a misdemeanor for each day or portion thereof. Such continuation continues after a 15-day period allowed for the correction of the violation or the written appeal of the violation delivered to the Tiverton Town Clerk's Office. Each day of the violation shall constitute a separate offense. You can't have a building inspector or property inspector indicating that there's a violation and instantly start fining somebody before they've ever been noticed, notified legally, and before they've had a chance to object, and before they've had a chance to request a hearing, or had a chance to correct the problem. You need to give somebody a reasonable chance to both appeal the decision and correct the pro and or correct the problem. B, it shall be unlawful and a public nuisance for any owner of property in this town to maintain, permit, suffer, or allow such vacant property to be maintained in such a manner that any one or more of the following conditions are found to exist for more than 24 hours following notification to the owner. He has to be notified. Can't just start without ever notifying the person. Uh, and C, I just 
capitalize the word owner and in the next uh, C1 and C2 the same thing capitalize the word owner under 47 a maintenance and monitoring of vacant buildings owners of any vacant commercial or residential building or structure and premises thereon shall maintain and monitor the subject property as followed within 10 days of obtaining the vacant property or the property becoming vacant the owner or the owner's agent shall post a notice in a conspicuous place on the front of the building in an area not clearly visible from the street stating the name address and telephone number of the owner and if applicable the owner's agent in control of the building the notice shall not be readable from the street so that the evidence of vacancy is not replaced by a notice a vacancy that is visible from the street for all thieves vagrants and homeless to see a copy of the notice of vacancy shall be delivered to the town clerk's office to be distributed to the police department the fire department and the building inspector and or the enforcement official does not make any sense to me to clean up properties so that they're not obviously vacant and a target for thieves and vandals and then after you clean it up so it's not such an obvious target you're going to post a notice that's clearly visible to the from the street with two inch high lettering oh that's so in case the guy can't the thieves can't see that it's vacant and they can get in there and strip all the copper from inside you're going to give them a notice to tell them that this is one of those homes it's it's ridiculous item two within 10 days of obtaining the vacant property or the property becoming vacant the owner or the owner's agent shall conduct an inspection of the interior and exterior of the building and the premises for any violation of this chapter or applicable state law and correct all violations as soon as practicable but in less than 15 days or as agreed to by joint agreement with the building inspector and or enforcement official and the town council if necessary to resolve any disagreement the correction shouldn't be unilaterally to the dictator with the dictatorial power being given to the building inspector or enforcement official you need to have some <coughs> definition of that and some recourse B, uh, item three thereafter an inspection of the property must be conducted no less than once every seven days to ensure the property is properly maintained I guess that uh, goes on properly maintained proper maintenance includes but is not limited to removal of trash rubbish and debris maintenance of landscaping and plants and good healthy condition maintenance of the exterior of the building including paint and finishes in reasonable condition Con uh, removal of dead dying or overgrown and in the parenthetical I added ie grass over 12 inches in height and bushes and trees with growth over a year and extending over structures and sidewalks then vet close parentheses vegetation and preventing the use of the property by unauthorized persons item four the property shall be maintained free of graffiti tagging and similar marking any removal of graffiti shall be with an exterior grade paint that matches and I have added the words reasonably the color of the exterior of the structure section 47 9 abatement procedure a I've just capitalized property B upon determining that the property located in the town of Turvedon is not secured or boarded and is improperly secured or boarded or is being maintained or monitored the enforcement official shall issue a notice of violation and demand to abate directed to the owner of the property the written notice shall be served either by personal delivery upon the record owner or by mailing a copy to the record owner 
by certified mail to the owner's last known address as it appears on the latest assessment roll of the town of Tiverton. B, after a written notice has been served, it shall be the duty of the owner to abate such violation, and I have added, after the word violation, as soon as practicable, but in less than 15, de 15 days, or as agreed to by joint agreement with the building inspector and or enforcement official and the town council, if necessary, to resolve any disagreement. 4710, I've just capitalized words to refer them back to the definitions in the definition chapter. And in 4711, if in the opinion of the, of the enforcement of official, and I've added, and with the written concurrence of the fire chief and or police chief, there exists a condition on any property which is of such a nature as to be eminently dangerous to the public health, safety, or welfare, which if not abated would during the pendency of this abatement procedure set forth in this chapter, subject to the public, subject the public to the potential harm of a serious nature, the same may be abated by the town with, with, without prior notice to the owner, comma, but with concurrent notice being sent to the owner and the owner's agent. Now, I believe that all of these changes are required to protect the interest of everybody concerned. We do need an ordinance to do this, but this should not be an all-inclusive ordinance to also define uh, a set of property standards. So if somebody lets their grass grow more than six inches high, uh, they can be declared uh, foreclosed or vacant. I know myself, I deliberately, particularly in the spring, let the grass grow to 10 inches high. Why? Because I mulch the grass. And when the grass reaches six inches in height, it develops its own seed for reseeding. That's why Scott's, the biggest seller of grass seed, I believe, in the entire country, tells people you can only cut one third of the height of the grass. If you cut it, if you want it at three inches, you have to cut it as soon as it gets to four and a half. They tell you that because if you wait until it gets to six, you won't need their grass seed. Your, your own grass will reseed itself. I also don't need somebody to tell me to cut my bushes. If I want to have some bushes that are kind of wild looking, if they're not overgrowing the area, if they're not blocking a sidewalk, if they're not causing a safety hazard on a street corner so that people are blind going around a street corner and could be causing an accident, then it should, it should be reasonable. Like I said in the, in the cover letter, a lot of the stuff must be carefully crafted to give people a certain degree of latitude on their own property. And, it, and this ordinance should have been written with the assumption that there was another ordinance, either written or that would be written in the near future, to actually cover maintenance of property. A lot of maintenance of property, particularly with today's economic conditions, is based on finances. If you don't have the money and you can't cut your own lawn, you do not hire somebody to cut it every week. You hire them to cut it every two weeks. And at certain times of the year, you tell them to skip another week. You shouldn't have some building inspector going around saying, hey, your grass is too high. And I hope you consider everything in here because <clears throat> I've had over 40 years of experience as a technical writer, as an engineer, design engineer, quality engineer, 
and as a certified quality auditor, I know how to write specs. I've written hundreds if not thousands of them and I've corrected more than I've written by editing specs that other people have written. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bettis. Mr. Tights. <coughs> um, thank you, Mr. President. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bennis has, has, very, uh, has a lot of good comments here. Obviously, I'm looking at it for the first time as you are tonight. Um, some of them are simple about, yes, property should be capitalized uh, as a defined term. Um, some I don't think I necessarily agree with as far as the limitations uh, as far as the enforcement officer, and the building official doesn't need the fire chief and the police chief to concur. He's already got the power under state law. If he sees an imminent harm to health and safety, he's already got the power to order a building even demolished if need be. So I wouldn't tamper with that. Um, what I would suggest perhaps is if you would want to continue the public hearing till our next meeting so that I could respond to these um, more detail. But before you do, um, there is one interesting philosophical question that I, it, it ha you know, I, it hadn't occurred to me, but was raised by Mr. Tabenis, and I would um, look to you for some guidance, which is about the sign. Um, most of these ordinances do have that idea that you have a sign posted so you know where the owner is so that people could know. He does raise a point that, you know, maybe that's uh, the scarlet letter that we don't want. Um, so I guess I, I, I hadn't thought of that, and I would look to you whether you would still want the sign for the public to see or you want to um, leave that off. Uh, again, I'm, I'm just going to just think out loud, so to speak. Uh, I think whether a sign is on the front of the building or on the side of the building, if a building is vacant, they don't even need a sign. They're going to know it's vacant. So I, I think we're not calling attention. I mean, you drive by a vacant property, I don't care who you are, you know if it's vacant or not. So I, I don't think a sign, you know, whether it's on the front or the side, because they're going to walk around the building if they don't think anybody's there. You know, so whether it's on the front or the side or the back of the building, they're going to see it. The, the question is, mm -hmm. um, do you want them to be able mm -hmm. to drive by at 30 miles an hour and jot down the address or do you want to force them to get out okay. and look around and actually peek in the windows Ms. Mr. Bennis be left totally blank Mr. Bennis you have to be by the mics if you're speaking and and you've said that so if you could if you could let the council comment if you're going to be getting up before the public hearing close but speaking from the audience does no good because it's not picked up on the record okay sorry <laughs> okay. no I, I, ju I just think that whether there's a sign or not. Okay. <clears throat> well, well, that's you know, what I'm so asking. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I don't have that feeling personally, one way or another. You know, I think it's probably, it's probably a bifurcated set of circumstances. Every foreclosed property I've ever seen has a big foreclosed. notice in the window saying this is the the maintenance agent. Uh, this is house has been winterized. This property is under the control of X Y Z. In case of emergency, contact these people. Uh, that can't be said necessarily for just plain old vacant properties necessarily, but um, I, I really don't feel strongly one way or the other. I suppose if it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, you know. I, I think the intent is so that I think neighbors and folks who might frequent or drive past such a property on a frequent basis has some sort of recourse you know in order to feel empowered to file a complaint or raise the issue or what have you so w whether or not the sign is physically on the building you know I could go either way as long as you know we at the town have some semblance of knowing who to contact in a situation where there is a vacant property or a unoccupied property or a foreclosed property and you know much like we had to do with the bank you know we had to do some outreach to try to get some action taken so you know I could go either way on it as long as we know the information so that we can take action if necessary I mean I think it's it's 
I wasn't here for the original uh, meeting where we discussed this, but I think it's, you know, an, a noble endeavor to try and prevent these sorts of situations. Um, and so I think if we keep that in mind, that the, the virtue of this is to provide some amount of recourse for neighbors who, who, and I, you know, I, Roger, I don't think it's it's anyone's intent to, uh, you know, lock up our neighbors when they don't cut their lawn uh, every week or their shrubs are of a displeasing color or anything else. Uh, I think it's really the the egregious um, eyesores that really do attract uh, the wrong kind of element and also uh, display both to the to the you know the market public that this is a place of um, you know unkempt uh, business or whatever it is um, but what was I just gonna say I forgot um, but anyway I think you know it's it's I know we get into this this <coughs> position with a lot of just plain old vacant commercial properties. I think the the the, pro the problem with residential properties is often the issue of foreclosure over just plain vacancy or unable to rent. I think that's a different set of circumstances and I don't know how we address or bring resolution to or bring some amount of um, um, empowerment to folks whose neighbors, and I know this just from you know, being in the real estate business, there are a lot of banks out there that don't quite know, or there are a lot of folks out there who don't quite know who owns the property at the end of the day. Um, and we face that a lot in properties in town. Well, XYZ, 15X Street, well, who actually owns the title to that property? Well, nobody knows, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's to pay, you know, it's, it takes months and months and months and months and months to sometimes figure out who actually holds, um, holds the note. And so I don't think we can fix that with an ordinance, but um, it's something we should consider, certainly, that this isn't going to be um, effective in those situations. So. If I may, Mr. President, um, as the originator of this or the request to have such an ordinance. I haven't heard anything yet mentioned about the safety factor. Okay, you know, there are people who will go into a vacant property and set it on fire. Okay, which endangers our firefighters, which endangers the neighboring property. Okay, and there are, there are you know, all types of of situations that we could get into that are of a safety nature, okay, uh, and, and you know that was one of my main reasons for requesting this was the safety, uh, in addition to the visibility. Uh, but if if the property is maintained to some level, and I'm not saying that the the grass has to be mowed every week and and so on and so forth, but maintained to some level. It, it gives an intruder that there is some type of presence there. Even if the building is empty, there is some type of presence <coughs> that somebody is maintaining the property, someone is around. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, th there are some issues here, um, that even I'm concerned with adding the town council. Uh, I, I don't believe that uh, that is within our purview uh, after something has been done by the enforcement official or building inspector as set forth in uh, our own uh, town government and the state. So uh, I, I would feel that just adds um, a delaying tactic, so to speak. Someone can say, well, I'll just bring it to the council, and it goes on and on and on. So I, I'm not in favor of that, but I, I, at this point in time, I think I would entertain a motion that we continue this to our next meeting, uh, continue the open hearing. I'll make a motion that we continue the public um, portion of this discussion to our next meeting and allow Mr. Tite's opportunity to further review Mr. Bennis's suggestions and 
if warranted, uh, bring back a revised uh, ordinance for review. I will second that, but I have a comment. Okay, discussion? Yeah, um, if no one else has anything. I, I, Andy, while you're reviewing these drafts and crafting some new language, if you're going to, um, and if it's the, um, the, the will of the council as well, there are various reference to derelicts, vagrants, criminals, thieves, and the homeless that um, are, I think, at the very least in bad taste and at the very most offensive. Um, and I would respectfully request you kind of avoid those sorts of terminologies. Okay. I don't mind the rodents, but... Mr. <laughs> Pelletier, do you really want to remove the word thieves and vagrants? I would like but the... Uh, don't we want to protect people's property in town from thieves and vagrants? I do, and I don't think that uh, no, removing no, those no. language, that bit of language, d doesn't, do, doesn't achieve that. Um, just because we don't say we are doesn't make it not so. I, I would support removing the word the homeless. homeless is, um, I, I think one does not, not equate homeless the other. Are vagrants and thieves yes. and so forth, and it certainly does apply that by putting it there. I and also, well, I, I'll, I'll clean it up a bit. Okay. I'm not, I won't remove every reference, but I will clean it up so we're not lumping everybody together like that. It just sounds like a very uh, petty and mm -hmm. uh, aristocratic thing to say about someone who may or may not be um, in a tough situation. Right. Sure. And identifying someone as a thief who, until they actually steal something, is not a thief. Or he's an alleged thief. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Unless otherwise convicted previously. Yes. <laughs> Still, you can't <laughs> assume. That's right. <laughs> until uh, brought to trial. And that is I, all I have. I, I just had a, a question, and this may or may not go uh, beyond the bounds of this particular proposed ordinance, but it's one thing to address this, and it's very important to address this, and I'm very glad that we are moving forward with this, to address this sort of issue with foreclosed and or vacant and or uninhabited dwellings here. But wh wh what is there, and this is just a point of information for myself, what is there in terms of ordinances in town to address um, such similar situations where the building is actually inhabited. And this is more on a residential than it yeah. is commercial. Um, there are various parts of the, um, of the code of ordinances and the building code which talk about um, where things being habitable and not. And um, as I said, there could be a case where the grass gets so high it becomes dangerous with rodents. Um, obviously we have issues with people who are storing a lot of junk on their property mm -hmm. um, and we you know already take action under the code there okay um, usually through municipal court okay great so Thank again you. and and notwithstanding the language here I mean everything we set forth it's a violation the first day you do it we don't go in and find anybody the first day we do it we always go in and inspect first and notice and, and try and get people to clean up things on their own and only if that doesn't work do we proceed with violations and court notices and the like. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Did you want to add something? No, yeah, no, Garrett. No, no, Garrett. Uh, if I may, um, in the 2013 <coughs> closing of the uh, latest code development cycle, the state of Rhode Island <laughs> adopted the um, property maintenance code. It addresses every one of the things I've heard. <coughs> excuse me, I've heard here tonight. Um, it's comprehensive. I haven't been able yet to use it on a particular case, but th this is this is it for the state of Rhode Island. Okay. Thanks. Jim, Thanks. can can we get a copy of that, or at least a summary of, of what that? I I have a copy. I <coughs> could you distribute? Could you make distribute copies, that? Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah, to just good. to have. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Is that available online? I have I a few believe. comments. Yes. From where? Uh, ICC. 
It has a carries a cost of twenty three ninety five. Um, I just have a few comments. Um, I think I need Chief Blakey. Yes. Um, I just want to know, do we know, have we identified all the vacant properties or foreclosed properties in town? Do I'm you sure. have an idea of? I'm sure what some of them have, but uh, I'm sure there are others that are vacant. Some of the things we're looking at, are not, primarily when I look at this, I look at the safety issues, visibility issues, places for kids may congregate and have a fit fires or you know the broken window theory when they see something there they're going to just going to gather there maybe make other problems <coughs> other people other neighborhoods other uh, properties be devalued so those are the type of things we look at um, ha have we had any occurrences of uh, forced entry on vacant properties um, inappropriate use nothing nothing excessive last one was uh, the building was torn down next to family ties I, I have to catch some kids going in that building one night and that's you know but there's not a lot of that going on because of such an area that's congested people see what's going on and they do keep an eye out for other people's properties but uh, you know all these things the safety is our primary place between myself and the fire chief that's how we look at the vacant properties safety our people responding to these areas going to the vacant buildings mm -hmm. and then mr garrett mr Rains would take over the other aspects <laughs> of it i just wanted to have an idea whether it was a um, large issue or is it just a a smaller issue it's it's a small issue okay uh, because this definitely impacts thank you chief sorry okay I'll stay Thanks. no no I, I I'm moving on <laughs> um, I do have to agree with uh, mr. Uh, Bennis uh, a bit here because it does anytime you put in an ordinance there are there's the intent of the ordinance and then there's the unintended consequences of putting that ordinance in and my opinion on on this ordinance is it's too broad um, it does in a way infringe upon property uh, owners rights to their property um, and could be used to by unhappy neighbors to complain about the house next door um, there are situations that occur that um, I think we have to realize the consequences of it and I'll go through a, a few of these. Uh, what happens under a, a FEMA event? Do all these timelines go out the window? Because we know FEMA has, uh, if there's a hurricane or a, a superstorm, uh, like we've experienced in the, in the last year, uh, do these policies apply? Does this ordinance apply? Because um, certainly down in New Jersey with Hurricane Sandy, there are still residents that haven't been uh, back to occupy their own homes and it's been almost a year um, then you run into situations where the life life uh, life changes um, you have um, unexpected military deployments so there's military considerations here because um, they can be deployed and and not returned for, for several months or six months or whatever um, then there's issues in bridging loans from one house to another. They could run into financial uh, situations with, with the banks so that it doesn't close for 60 or 90 days. Uh, there could be unexpected medical situations where a person has broken their hip. They can't take care of their lawn. Um, and they're in a, in a rehab center. Um, again, it could be the same thing with the, this is a second home. It's a winter residence, a uh, summer residence, and the winter residence is in Florida. Uh, the person's not necessarily going to be here and see that broken window um, to fix it within 15 days. They're not going to be here. Um, and then there's the situations where there is financial hardship, and we have an uh, aging population in Tiverton, and they're not going to be able to afford uh, fixing that broken window versus buying their medicine. So I think there's a, a lot of situations here uh, that we could be impacting uh, the residents in this town uh, and not intending to do that. Um, certainly, even with businesses, um, they can't necessarily um, start up a business and have a problem. They're, they're vacant. They can't the owner can't get another business in 
uh, to occupy the place, again, broken window, does this now kick in, this ordinance? So there's, there's a lot of um, consequences to this ordinance, and I think it needs to be more thoroughly vetted. Uh, certainly, Roger has uh, quite a few ideas. Mr. Bennis has a lot of ideas that he's brought before the council. And, and I kind of, um, we do have one property in my neighborhood that does have, it's, it's foreclosed, it does have the sign on the window. And the neighbors are aware of that and, and do look out for it. Um, certainly, if the, I think neighbors are, are friendly, they'll, they'll know what the situation is with the, the house next door or the house down the street and be aware of any criminal activity or any kids just hanging around. Um, so I think we need to think this through um, more thoroughly. Um, that's all I have for my comments right now. Thank you. Mr. Roderick, will a new, uh, new revision to the ordinance be available online prior to the next meeting so that somebody can review it before then? Um, yes, it, it will it'll certainly be online before the week before when it's posted with clerk base. Um, I don't know if it'll be available before then online, um, but um, I'll, I'll see that you get a copy of it once I have your email here on your stationery, I think, so I'll right. send you a copy of it. Thank you. <coughs> All right, we have a motion, a second to uh, continue this uh, public hearing to our next meeting which is October 28th. October 28th, 2013. All those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Continuing public hearing. Public hearing for proposed ordinance amendment. Oh, we did that one. Done. Uh, Board of Licenses. Public hearings advertised. Junkyard and secondhand dealers license renewal December 1st, 2013 through November 30th, 2014, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Mr. President, I just want to make sure um, Mr. Peter Monis sent an email with a comment on one of these licenses. I just want to make sure you at least read that. Thank you. Um, Chief Blakey. Yes, sir. I'm sure you didn't see this, but you probably could comment on this. Just for clarification, Just I think for this clarification. is re referencing Tiffany Auto Parts, not Tiffany Auto Body. Yeah. I, I think we've once before told them to remove some cars, Chief, didn't we? I'm sorry, I just got this clocked in today. I should have sent you a copy. I have spoken with the I'm, so I'm, with I'm sorry, Chief. Back. Chief, just sorry, would you use the mic, please? Microphone. I personally stopped at that business some time ago and I did tell them to move cars back from both sides of the roadway. Um, I think their employees cars are across the street and I'll look at this definitely look at this again okay. and rectify it. Okay. I was just, I just received this now. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll take that. I'll make sure you get a copy Thank Chief. That's my copy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moniz, for bringing that to our attention. If you're here. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, beginning, shall we take them separately or all as one? Uh, are there any issues on any of them, Madam Clerk? Um, the junkyard licenses, just the one I... Uh, just the one we just... Yeah, yeah, I think, think you'll take yeah. them all at once and just ask if, if there's okay. any public comments on any of them. Okay. Uh, any money from the public? Uh, Arnold's Auto Parts, 1484 Crandall Road. General Auto Recycling, Incorporated, 384 King Road. Alan J. Lagasse, doing business as Lagasse, Salvage Yard, 20 Corey's Lane. Sanford and Son LTD, 104 Cynthia Avenue. South Shore Tiverton LLC, 413 Boogamash Road. Tiverton Auto Parts Incorporated, 541 Boogamash Road. 
to an auto pods incorporated 533 Bogomash Road and lot 116 COD 29. Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anything from the council? I just have a quick question, and Mr. Tights, you might be able to help me here. Is there um, anything as it relates to junkyard and secondhand kind of car dealers? In particular, I'm thinking junkyards from an environmental perspective, regulating, um, I guess, automotive waste leakage, that sort of stuff that might uh, compromise watershed, anything of the sort? Um, there's that would be covered under the particular things I mean if they happen to be located in the watershed then they're going to be subject to the watershed overlay requirements um, they're also going to be subject to DEM requirements um, in their operation okay um, they are Mr. Tights so DEM covers everything from auto fluff everything that goes into the car everything has to be disposed of should the site in the future be um, used for other purposes. It has to pass a test that there's been per all the, the uh, oil stains, transmission flows, everything has to be excavated out and then okay. it has to be brought back to a certain state. So there are laws in place for that. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay. Anything else from the council? I move that we uh, approve the seven secondhand dealer and junkyard, junkyard and secondhand dealer licenses there are seven, right? Yes. Subject yes. To. Subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Continuing as a board of licensing, liquor license renewal, December 1st, 2013 to November 30, 2014. Subject to meeting all legal requirements. We will take them by class, starting with class A liquor stores. Chandri Incorporated doing business as Tiverton Liquor, 65 Main Road. Nimraj Incorporated doing business as Crossroad Liquors, 1540 Boogamash Road. And Smitten Incorporated doing business as Stonebridge Liquors, 2490 Main Road. Okay. Anyone from the public? <coughs> Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anything from the council? We're, these are all good? No. Get them. There's a lot of requirements. That's why we have now begun to put them on the agenda a little bit earlier, because they have to get um, certificates of good standing from the state. There's a lot of requirements okay. that will make it subject to, to meeting. meeting. The, the taxes have to be paid. The state is weighs in on this. But this gives them a chance. Usually when we do it in uh, November, I end up uh, battling some of them that we have to close because they haven't met it by the deadline. So we get, we're trying to give the, these businesses a little head start and getting everything ready here. So. Okay. And if I can just add, I mean, this is the point of having a public hearing so that, you know, it gets advertised to the people know. If, if they have a problem, if they live near a bar, a restaurant, liquor store, and there's a problem or even a junkyard, um, this is their chance to come and let you know about it. That's why they have to come back every year. So. Mm -hmm. I move that we approve the Class A liquor license renewals for the three listed Chandra, Nimraj, and Smitten, Inc., subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> Continuing with the Class BV full liquor licenses. Silver Brothers Incorporated doing business as Barcello's Family Restaurant, 1214 Stafford Road. Spring Restaurant Incorporated, 118 120 Main Road. The Moulin Rouge Incorporated, 1403 Main Road. Benjamin Sports Pub Incorporated, 4 Stafford Road. Faith J. Bortz doing business as PJ's Cafe, 301 State Avenue. Evelyn's Nanaquacker Drive In Incorporated, 2335 Main Road. Kofori Inc. doing business as Brantel's Restaurants, Banquet and Catering Facility, 9197 Crandall. The Boathouse Restaurant, LLC, 227 Schooner Drive. Nani's Incorporated doing business as Nani's Kitchen and Pasta Shop, 1154 Stafford Road. Hujan Incorporated doing business as Little Bear Sports Lounge, 983 Main Road. 
Everett Lane Incorporated doing business as fam Family Ties Restaurant, 221 Main Road. Atlantic Sports Pub Incorporated, 70 Shove Street. Susan's Restaurant, 13 Crandall Road. DNL Corp, 180 Main Road for 79 Main Road. <coughs> Black Goose Company doing business as Black Goose, Ca Black Goose Cafe, 2160 Main Road. Millie Lou LLC doing business as Bistro 520, 524 Main Road. Okay. Well, um, Mr. President? Um, I would ask that you um, pull number 14, DNL Corp. Yeah. Uh, what is from the list? Okay. Um, Madam Clerk, would you uh, tell the council who DNL or what DNL is? Yeah, That's the place. Buddy's restaurant that is <coughs> their renovations. Mm -hmm. And they've been out of receivership now for over a year. So we'll have to discuss that one separate. If you well, could make a. Yeah, but what does it mean when it says 180 Main Road for 79 Main Road? Because the owner, it's 79 Main Road is <coughs> Buddies. Buddies. But it's mm -hmm. Buddies. 180 is. Um, oh, is okay. That, the, the Chinese uh, restaurant. Yes, yeah, Chinese okay. mm -hmm. takeout. Right. Yeah. And he actually owns. Oh, okay. That's why. That makes yeah. sense. Yep. I mean, I if you want to take this one first before the others, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. we could okay. uh, discuss uh, it. So we'll uh, DNL Corp 180 Main Road for 79 Main Road. First, we'll begin with anything from the public. <laughs> the, uh, I have had an officer checking all these because uh, the Madam Clerk was able to give early, so we have been doing it already. Uh, there is another one, and it escapes me which one, that also has not been checked. Uh, buddies, former buddies, has definitely has not been open. So, subject to all legal requirements, we were going to ask you not move to vote at, at a later date. But if you are bringing it up now, it's, no, we can't contact anyone there. And there was one other one in just case. Mm -hmm. But we've checked them all, and those there were two that were just not uh, not available to contact. And that was one. Okay. I'm sorry, chief. Who was the other one? I I'll get some oh, okay. I just forgot which one it was. So. But I doubt it's any of these because they're all. They have until December 1st for that inspection. Mm -hmm. okay. My, my con the concern with, with Buddy, the fact is um, the, um, the state through the Department of Business Regulation, and uh, you're not supposed to sit on, an, on, a, on a license with an unopened restaurant. Now, there is an exception. If the property is in litigation, then that stays the time period. Mm -hmm. This was in re receivership that was in litigation. However, it's been out of litigation now for a while. Um, my suggestion was going to be um, to do it, A, subject to meeting all legal requirements, so they're still going to have to, before it can be issued, they're going to have to comply with everything. But also granted only for three months to March 1st, 2014, because um, I do think we need to keep up with, otherwise it's going to be almost two years that will have been sitting around if we let it go all the way around to the end of November 2014. So there's nothing prohibiting him from reapplying for a liquor license in the future. No, but he would have to address that as a new liquor license. You would have to notice all the abutters and all. And right. he, I did explain <coughs> to him that there could be <coughs> restrictions on this because he also <coughs> faced a problem of when he started to do the renovations. He can't do anything until he gets the renovations and everything done. Obviously, he can't even open. But uh, when he began doing that, they closed it down because it was unsafe to be in there doing it and he had to do some additional work so it's kind of been prolonged but he has had since September uh, since June I believe it is clearance from the building official and whatnot to get in there and get the work done he did submit a plan a, a, mm -hmm. a layout of the restaurant and the kitchen but he told me himself he's just not you know it's slow working and it's not going to be there we can't hold it forever so because we were limited to, I seven, did, to 16. Yes, right. I suggest that you would he would be probably council would be putting limits on it and he seemed to be responsive. I also requested he come but uh, I don't <coughs> see him, so. Mr. Sure. President, that was the stone the uh, Stone Bridge. Stone Bridge that's restaurant. The other one. There is no license to the yeah, Stone okay. Bridge restaurant. Mm -hmm. They were checking in that so that's going now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was some rent. So what I what I'm saying is that we have a limit on the amount of liquor licenses we no yes I'm just yeah, for licenses. full liquor licenses for restaurants yes. 16 oh. no, only for class A. really 
Because I thought no. we went through this the no, last we time. we have full lipid license, and I think we have 18 on it. Okay, do we? Because we expanded it when yeah, we did. Yeah. Susan's. Susan's. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And then we added a few extra. Did we? Okay, yeah, good. We did. All right, then yeah. my so concerns are quelled. So there are available quelled. licenses. Mm -hmm. Plus, so remember, um, Stone Bridge has surrendered their license, so, so that's an available so that's license. Okay, so we have, we have two up. So, so I'm less concerned than I was 35 seconds ago. So can I just understand that we put a max of 18 full liquor licenses for yes. the town? Is that? Yes. Okay. We used to have 15, and then we had an applicant come in with a new restaurant in town that wanted to expand to serve alcohol. So we added, we, we approved that, and we added two additional sure. licenses. Just so three total, um, I think that's how it was. Or something yeah, to that. Yeah, we had effect. fifteen. We had fifteen. I and then a new one came. We gave the sixteen. And then we added two. E we added two extras. Because we also yes, added five twenty four. Yep. When something mm -hmm. came open. It, it's just the process that on a renewal they do not notice the abutters. They, it just has to get advertised. So anybody who has a complaint, oh. and we track anybody who calls with any complaints, the chief has, and we track them. When you. Um, if you surrender your license, or in this case, if you, if anybody changed to a different type of license from a full, you have to go back out and advertise, and that's when you tend you have to notice every yeah. one of those abutters, yep. and that's mm -hmm. sometimes is when well, I, they get more. Response. I'm less concerned about, and I and I'd rather not put him in in a situation of undue uh, grief or um, work or expense to to get a new license if he's. You know, if we were at our max, maybe I think that that would be a little more um, important because he's holding, potentially holding it, but he's not. And so, I mean, it, I, I'm not as concerned. The council, the rest of the council might have um, a different opinion, but um, I'm willing to, you know, sort of give him some time. But you're limited because yeah. of the state. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. I mean, right, you can, I mean, I suggested that as one. You, I mean, you, you can actually deny it. You could deny the renewal and no, say, well, I'm okay. No, I'm saying not deny okay. it. I'm saying right. give him The other thing maybe you want, I don't know if you want to just, again, since we're starting nice and early here in October, if you want to continue it to the next meeting, you know, um, not act on it, continue it to the next meeting, requesting again that he show up so you can actually talk to the uh, license holder individually if you want. Um, th there's a whole variety of, of different things that you can do. So my, my thought on the, the timing was just as a compromise between allowing allowing the renovation of the building but not letting it drag on a whole other year before you're looking at it again. But you may well, want to wait to even do that. Yeah, well, I, I think it's reasonable to go to March 1st and um, take it up at that time. Uh, he's had, he's, he or she has been given the opportunity to come before the council and they didn't show. So uh, I'm not sure if extending it's going to change that. Yeah, I'm not sure he's, mm -hmm. we're, we're going to know any more than we do now. Mm -hmm. We know pretty much the long and the short of it. Mm -hmm. uh, would he have to pay another uh, li full license fee? He always has to pay the fee. <laughs> we always collect the fee, even if it's not open, because we're holding that license. He essentially has the license, but it is not issued because he hasn't met all the requirements. Mm -hmm. It's been granted. Once it's granted, he has to pay for it. Right, so but he pays the eight hundred dollars. If we only go to March first, does he pay another eight hundred dollars? Oh, I guess we'd prorate it then. We have prorated some before like that too. So long as it's prorated, <coughs> I don't have a problem yeah. with it because yeah. I don't want to, you and know, pay the eight hundred dollars if it's denied in March. In March. March. <coughs> yeah, it would be the remainder of the year. Right. Yep. Okay. That's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I want to entertain a motion on D and L Corporation. Have been closed on that one. I will close. Yeah, there's anybody else in the public. Yeah, anyone else from the public on DNL Corp? Anyone else? Anyone else? Saying no, no, I'll entertain a motion on DNL Corp. I move that we approve a Class B V li full liquor license for DNL Corporation for the term of December is it December first, twenty thirteen to March first, twenty fourteen, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. We have, um, yeah. Yeah, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Okay, before we go on, on the next one, I just have a question on Susan's restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, you do it's not Susan. have to go back and vote on all the rest of the... Yeah. yeah. We're, we're, we're still in the open hearing on the other right, ones. Yeah, right. I just have a question. Should that be doing business as... 
I'm, I'm Wally's Town House. That? No, it isn't doing it. That, that's what the license is in, Susan's Restaurant. Okay. And they just call it. They, they just uh, call it that. Wally's okay, Town I just was confused. Yeah, no, that's exactly what the license still remains in, Susan's Restaurant. Okay. Okay. Okay, is anyone from the public on the remaining uh, Class BV full liquor licenses? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anything from the council? I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we renew uh, the Class BV full liquor license for the term of December 1st, 2013 to November 30th, 2014, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. Uh, for the, uh, for four. the uh, list of 16. 15. 15. 15, because we pulled out right. you know, For the 15 remaining... Um, uh, places of business. Second. We have a motion, a second. All those in favor? I don't know if you want me to read them, but sure. Motion carries. Remind them they have to serve food. <coughs> they have to serve food. Okay, continuing as a uh, board of licensing on class VVL, limited looking license, classic pizza, 495 Main Road, Sewell Seabury. Associates doing business as Four Corners Grill, 3841 Main Road. Fu Li Hua Corp doing business as Asian Gourmet, 1715 Stafford Road. And anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anything from the council? Shall we wait for Mr. Pelletier? We're a quorum. <laughs> I, I will entertain a motion on the Class BVL licenses. I'll make a motion that we renew the <coughs> Class BVL limited liquor licenses for the three establishments um, that the council president uh, mentioned before for the term of December 1, 2013 <coughs> through, dis, uh, through November 30th, 2014, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Mr. Pelletier, would you like to vote yes. on the Class BVLs? Yes. Um, in favor. Okay, it is unanimous. Sorry about that. Okay. Continuing as a Board of Licensing, Class BT, Bed and Tavern, Senior Lifestyle, Sakonet Bay LP, 1215 Main Road. Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anything from the Council? I will entertain a motion. I move that we approve the Class BT Bed and Tavern license to the Senior, lifeti senior Lifestyle Sakonet Bay LP, subject to meeting all legal requirements. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh. Motion carries. Class D, Unlimited Club Licenses. Father Joseph Bear, Columbian Club Incorporated, doing business as Knights of Columbus, 28 Fish Road. Woodrow L. Sylvia, Post Home Association Incorporated, 134 Shove Street. Bayview Holy Ghost Citizens Club, 66 Bottom Street. Anything from the public? Anyone from the public? Anyone from the public? Seeing none, anyone, anything from the council? No. Okay, I, I just have a question. Bayview Holy Ghost Citizens, are they still really? Yeah, they still open? Yeah. yeah, okay. Just haven't seen them do anything in a long time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything, anything from the council? Okay. Uh, I move we award a Class D unlimited club license to the three listed uh, subject to meeting all re legal requirements. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. That closes the public hearings. Appointments and resignations. Juvenile Hearing Board reappointments. Eugene Raposa, 413 Hooper Street, 
three-year term expiring 10 15 2016 is mr. Raposa here uh, mr. president he called and said he was going to be unable to attend he had some visitors in okay. these are reappointments and it happened that I did an advertisement mm -hmm. and these came in and they required uh, the chief to do some background checks so that's why we put these on this week next week we'll start putting more of the yep. um, group Be B I believe yep. they're on okay chief because the applicants uh, handle police reports and have access to some private matters we do require they do a background check on the applicants and uh, no dis uh, disqualifying information was found on either party thank you you're welcome Okay. Nancy, why do we have a copy of one but not of the other? Oh, you mean of the background check? Yes. The chief had one uh, later. Okay. Distinct. Okay. One of the background checks, chief. So the, the yeah. Only one of the background yeah, checks. Yeah, only one was in the package. Mr. Uh, Raposa dropped it off at the police station. Okay. Yes. Okay. So just make sure we get a copy of that for our records. Certainly. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Anything from the council on Mr. Raposa? Okay. No. Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. I move that we reappoint Eugene Raposa to a three-year term expiring 10-15-2016 to the Juvenile Hearing Board. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Carries. Donna Cook, 192 Hilton Street, first alternate, one-year term expiring 10-15-2014. Ms. Cook? I'm just reapplying. I enjoyed um, being on the board. I, I fill, did the uh, fill-in for, I think it was second alternate, and uh, someone um, resigned, so I was moved to first alternate, so I guess I'm, I'm being promoted. Um, I, it, it is very interesting, um, and I'd like to continue doing it. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anything from the council? Okay, I will entertain a motion. I'll move that we um, reappoint Ms. Donna Cook as a first alternate to the Juvenile Hearing Board for the one-year term expiring uh, October 15th, 2014. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Okay, moving. Unfinished business, none. Financial business, none. New business, town administrator, ratification of executive administrative assistant contract, three-year contract, July 23rd, 2013, to July 22nd, 2016, Mary Lou Sullivan. I would ask that the uh, council approve this contract. Uh, this individual has uh, been employed just over a year at this point and she has adjusted well and made contributions to her position. Uh, she deals well with our benefits as well as advising our employees on their benefits and taking care of any issues that may arise from the employees and their benefits. Uh, she deals with a lot of the complaints that comes into my office and she does that well. She's an asset to the town and my office. Uh, the contract that is being offered to her is <coughs> consistent with the town benefits and the salary is consistent with the AFSCME contract, although she is not a union employee. Is Ms. Sullivan here? No, she isn't. Okay. okay anything from the council? Uh, go ahead, Bill. I, I just had a quick question if memory serves I, I, I just I question the I guess the need or the relevance to reference the asks me I can't even say that properly but um, wh why we need to mention that as a what feels to be a quasi benchmarking kind of the, the only place counselor I believe that that reference is 
It's, it's under health insurance. It's under health yeah. insurance. Yeah. And it, it just so that everyone has the same health insurance. We all have the HSA, yep. uh, high deductible HSA. And uh, I didn't think that that would be an issue because when, when the issue, when the coverage changes, it co changes for everyone. Sure. What, what is the, um, is there a problem with just referencing that specific health and dental insurance program? Rather than saying it mirrors AFSME? Well, it just, it would just give definition to the what health program, is. what it is. But it in the AFS AFSME contract, there is a reference to some specific plan, right? It would just be the Blue Cross HSA. Why can't we just write that in here? We can do that. Because I'm just, if AFSME all of a sudden negotiates a different contract, does this contract change? It would. Okay, that's what I'm trying to avoid. Okay. It should pro perhaps have the same wording as in the model contract. I mean, I agree that we want to keep, if we, we want to keep things uniform and, and on, on an even keel. I just, I worry that we're, we're pegging um, one contract to another contract and uh, they're not necessarily, they're not dictated by the same set of arrangements and same set of um, requirements. She's not a union employee um, and I, I think it's a little, a little, I don't know. It puts us at, at a risk of something changing that then this now changes or um, that worries me a little bit. Not, I mean, not losing sleep over it, but it's something that concerns me. I concur. Yeah, yeah I think we should make that change just to uh, the employee shall have health and dental insurance based on the current HSA or whatever terminology we used in the other contract. Okay. Will okay. the council approve it pending that change or? I, I have no issue as long as that change is made. Um, the, the only thing I just want to just clarify and I think should a new health contract be negotiated, I, w I would believe that we would not keep one person under an old one. Yeah, we'd have to renegotiate this contract to include any changes. Well, in the case, as amended from time to time. Yeah. So. Okay, just just making sure that everyone understands that. Okay. Is there anything else from the council? Oh, yeah, just one question. The uh, oh, never mind. The yeah, never mind. I'm going to say it anyway. The first line ag uh, agreement entered on into this blank day of July 2013, is that going to be a current date of October, whatever today is, the 17th, 15th, it, it can be, but if you notice the term. You know, I know the term is, but we're not signing the, the agreement in July. No. It's just retroactive. Right. Yeah. So it should be this date today. in October. Whatever today's date is. Mm -hmm. Today's what? March 30th, right? <laughs> October 15th. Okay. okay. Anything else from the council? Mm -hmm. Okay, then I will entertain a motion uh, w with the changes as described, the change in the agreement date, the change uh, under health insurance to state uh, HSA and to delete references to the AFSME contract. Move. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. DPW Director Stephen Berlucci, permission to junk six town vehicles. Let me let me begin this by saying this is a little different than what we've done in the past. Okay, in the past, we've just taken all of our junk vehicles 
and we have solicited bids and we have sold drivable vehicles for forty dollars we have sold drivable vehicles for fifty dollars and I think the the most we ever got for any of these vehicles was maybe two hundred dollars <laughs> so <coughs> the, the DPW director has contacted three of the local salvage yards and they are willing to give us $2,500, the, the highest bidder was $2,500 for the six vehicles, which is just over $400 each. So I think by not advertising and going out for bids, we're actually saving money by just calling the, this junkyard and say, come and get them and bring your check. So this is a little bit different than we've done in the past. And some of these vehicles, I might add, are not drivable. So, uh, with that, if Mr. Bellucci has anything to add. You said none, none of them are drivable. Okay, uh, Steve, could, could we just park these on your front lawn with a for sale sign? Um, I think they're worth more in junk, to tell you the truth. <laughs> they really are. Most of them don't have tires. Transmissions are gone. They've been picked through. We've used parts for uh, running cars. They're really, really junk. Besides, we have an ordinance against having that many vehicles on the lawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, okay, I will entertain a motion. I'll move that uh, we uh, permit DPW Director Bellucci to junk the six town vehicles as illustrated um, in council packet content uh, G2. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Good luck. Good luck. Bids and requests for proposals. <laughs> Director, DPW Director Bellucci. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as brought to you before, uh, I requested bids to go out for guardrail on an as-needed basis. If there's an accident and something needs to be replaced, um, and three bids were received. Uh, they were all good bids. Uh, even though the bid prices range from $14,000 to $30,000, uh, we certainly at this particular time um, don't intend to use any of those, that amount. Um, if there's an accident, and we have to go out and fix it, we're going to have to go out and fix it. But there's no plans right now to put guardrail anywhere uh, that's planned. So uh, these are reflective prices that give us uh, opportunities uh, to repair various types of guardrail. I even put some in new if we find a place that's uh, hazardous and needs some uh, guardrail, uh, we can use these um, competitive bid prices. So I'm asking uh, to award the contrast to Costco for $14,500. Uh, they've represented themselves very well in, in the past three years. Uh, we've used them twice, and uh, they're responsive, and their prices are very competitive. So we're recommending the award for $14,500 to Costco Incorporated. Okay, anything from the council? Mm -hmm. and, and the money is not going to come out of paving, and I hope to put two items in next year's budget budget one will be for guardrail and second will maybe be for lines so stuff will maybe be broken out a little better thank you mr Bellucci. okay sir okay. anything else from the council okay i will entertain a motion i move that we award <coughs> contract for guardrail services to costco inc to be used on an ads needed basis and not to exceed and not to exceed fourteen thousand five hundred dollars Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Motion carries. I thank you. Thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Leroy Kendrick, Chairman of Wastewater Management. Mr. Good Kendrick, evening. Mr. Lincourt. Good evening.
Uh, we uh, come before you today to ask that you approve uh, two things. One, that uh, uh, we uh, ask that you forego the formal bid process. Uh, we actually went out and got two quotes for the services of a, of a, uh, a professional to help us draft a uh, uh, enabling legislation for a, a wastewater uh, sewer district. And so we got uh, a price from uh, Steve Levy of the Atlantic States Rural Water Association. <coughs> They're a not-for-profit uh, agency and their price is not to exceed $12,000. We also went out to Jim Jeremiah and Associates, an engineering firm, uh, for the same services with the same scope of work. His price was $23,000. So uh, we need to uh, get going on the enabling legislation so that we can uh, uh, hopefully go before the winter session in, uh, for the state, uh, I think it's in January. Good. Anything from the council? I, uh, just <coughs> one quick question. So it sounded like instead of going through a, a formal RFP process, you did some due diligence to kind of see what the market offered in terms of services. Yes. There's, there's not a lot of people out here that, that do this. And Steve Levy has done over 50 of them in New England. And so he, by far he's done the most in New England and so but we did want to get one other just to kind of make sure the price was good and as it turns out his price is, is really good because apparently not for profit and he's done it enough that he's very efficient at it. We tested to see if that was the case and and it proved to be the case. And, and this $12,000 is paid for by the wastewater management Correct. commission? Correct. It's in our budget. It's in your budget. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned that this project will help us identify issues that will need to be considered, such as governance rates and future relationship with the town. Correct. Is that, uh, I know there's five tasks. Um, is that considered um, task three, development meeting? Because I was trying to see where that would be identified that 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 would be um, that would be in task three and and written up in task four right all right thank you ba basically we want the enabling legislation to to have all of these points in there so okay. all right thank you anyone else from the council okay uh, I I think it's a good idea that, that uh, instead of going out to bid and dragging out the process and seeing whatever, I mean, in these type of situations, there are a limited number of people yeah, who do this specialty. to begin with. It's a specialty. Right. Yeah. Um, so I commend you for your due diligence in, in finding these people uh, and then having it budgeted, which oh, I like that a lot when it's already budgeted. Uh, so um, I will entertain a motion. Do, you, do we need to do this in two phases? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I would move that we award permission to waive the RFP for professional services to create the Tiverton Sewer District. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. And I would also move that we award the contract for professional services to Atlantic States Rural Water and Wastewater Association of North Kingstown with a contract not to ex a price not to exceed twelve thousand dollars. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you very Thanks, much. Gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Town Administrator, items and announcements. I just have two announcements this evening. Uh, the first one being the uh, amount of the check that we received for recycling from the Rhode Island Resource Recovery was $15,374. And the second announcement oh, is Jim, that- Jim, before you go on, how does that compare to last year? It was much more. Last uh, year? No, last year was more. Yeah, that's um, We 
currently have in our recycling account $47,270. Uh, the tonnage was higher this year. Okay, but the pricing was lower. Yeah. So that's what diminished the reward. Okay. Uh, as far as the recycling goes, uh, this, this September we recycled 167 tons versus last September 136 tons. So it was a 23% increase uh, for the month. That's all I have. Thank you. J Jim, just a point of clarification. W what is the money in that account typically used for? Uh, it's used for recycling efforts. We haven't really used much of it. We, we use just a little bit of it. Uh, but we're uh, looking to do something significant with it. Uh, one of the ideas may be working with Patriot to obtain, and I'm not saying that we're going to do this. This is, you know, the recycling committee has to discuss this. But some of the ideas may be, you know, the one arm bandit to pick up uh, the recyclables so that it all goes in one big barrel instead of all these bins. Okay, but there's a significant cost to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we can save that much money. Uh, but it's there for the recycling committee to be able to use to improve and enhance our recycling efforts. That's what it has to be used for. It cannot be used for anything else. So any potential <coughs> project that might tap into those funds needs to get routed through the recycling committee? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Council announcements, comments, and questions. I have uh, two quick ones. Uh, the first one is, uh, it sort of came to me as I was driving here. We have bike lanes in some on some roads in Tiverton now, and it's a fairly new uh, thing. And so I think maybe, and I don't know if I'll, I'll just submit something for the, for the next meeting. Uh, I noticed also a lot of people parking in bike lanes. <laughs> which uh, sort of defeats the purpose of having a bike lane. Um, I don't know if there's a way we can promote um, what the requirements are, and it looks like a breakdown lane, but it's actually a bicycle lane, so don't park into them, so park, it, park in them and whatnot, and uh, just general kind of bring awareness to where the bike lanes in town are, because they're really, um, really fun uh, to have and exciting to see um, dedicated bike lanes. Because I know a lot more people are biking nowadays, and it's a safety concern. That's the first one. The second one is um, I just wanted to ask Andy to, for the next meeting or two, um, gather some information on the police pension board, how it's developed, what the requirements are for um, for folks to be members of the police pension board, how we got to where we are today, and some. Maybe a couple of here's and there's notes on what the council's authority to appoint people or whatever is. Um, I just want to understand it better. There was a recent um, advisory opinion from the uh, Rhode Island Ethics Commission that has made me reconsider whether or not I am conflicted out of participating in police pension board matters, essentially pending on my own ethics opinion. Um, it looks like I might be able to participate. And if that's the case, I'd like to participate to the extent I can, because I think I, I do have some um, skills that might assist. So just um, while I'm writing my um, ethics opinion request and waiting the ridiculous amount of time it takes for them to respond, uh, maybe you can just jot down a few things. That would be helpful. And it might be helpful for the rest of the council to understand what the dynamics of that group are and, and how we um, how we get people on there and how we move people on or address issues like that. I think well that's for the it. person who actually is on the board. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Well, for the person who's actually on the board <laughs> also. <laughs> it's helpful for everybody <coughs> I think, to okay. have some context and, and whether or not um, if, if the ethics opinion proves to be um, successful, whether or not um, we can add, uh, you know, if the, if the council is so um, 
inclined to add another name to that to that board as a representative from the council I'd be happy to um, to sit in on those meetings um, but un up until t th this past week when that uh, ethics opinion came in front of me uh, I was presumed conflicted out but um, so anyway that's just information for us to consider in the future <coughs> thank you okay, anyone else I'd just like an update on the volunteer appreciation night. Yes, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> we've sent out the letters <coughs> to all the um, boards and commissions. We've started, we've received quite a few back, so this is just the process of it. And then Jan's on board with it, and next week we'll just get it together. And the date is yeah. October? Oh, I'm sorry. The date is October 25th on a Friday night at 6 o'clock. Thank you. And all boards, members, commissions, and their families are invited. Okay. Anyone else from the council? Okay, I, I just have one thing, and, and uh, I just want to address the, and then I will address Ms. Cookleaf. Yes. Oh, then I will, I will save my comments for when she's here. Okay, then moving along, town solicitor. Thank you. Um, first item here is just um, <coughs> Town of Tiverton versus James and Ms. Ms. Pelletier. And I provided you with a copy of the <coughs> written decision that was issued by the um, Superior Court, Judge Sundberg, um, in which she uh, concluded that the town had proven beyond a reasonable doubt that uh, the defendants, James and Melissa Pelletier, doing business as Tiger Tree, um, had been illegally manufacturing compost in violation of the zoning ordinance. Um, I provided it to you just as it was provided to us. She, she attached her earlier opinion from a, a year before on the motion to dismiss and incorporated the findings, basically finding that during the trial in July, the defendants had not been anything done anything to overturn the initial proof that the town had done in proving its case. So um, we will be moving forward with this case. Um, we've asked the judge to schedule a hearing on sentencing and I just received in fact earlier today a letter objecting to our motion for judgment um, and asking for a hearing uh, to determine whether imposition of a sentence is necessary. So, so either way, we'll be having further hearings before the judge before we get any further at this point. What's the timeline look like for that? Um, probably over the two months or so. Okay. Um, the you know the Judge Thunberg is handling the criminal calendar in, in Washington County currently, and yeah. he's dealing with felony trials and murders and things like that. And um, so we unfortunately have to take a a back seat and get to the times that she can find free for us to deal with this. Um, <clears throat> next one, number two, McLaughlin versus Town of Tiverton. Um, I don't have anything in writing for you, but I just wanted to report um, the judge gave a decision from the bench. The town prevailed on this. This is where um, Ms. McLaughlin uh, built a garage too close to the setbacks. Um, <coughs> went to the zoning board, the zoning board denied relief, and then the appeal was taken here to the Superior Court. Um, we've pressed forward on that, we've pressed on that, um, got briefing, got a decision, and as I said, the court gave a decision from the bench um, upholding the town zoning board that the garage is illegally there. Um, we are waiting for a transcript so that we will have the details of what the judge said and have an order, um, and then we'll try to move forward on enforcement on that as well. And that's probably also another month or two. Okay. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, input enforcement looks like, is that something that is is outlined in the judge's no, um No, ruling? in fact. How does that? No, in, in fact, um, and this was um, handled by Assistant Solicitor Gina Desenzo. In fact, she asked specifically when the judge finished dictating the decision and he said, you know, they ended the order to enter, which means we're supposed to submit an order. I said, and she asked specifically about um, getting the power to order it moved. And he said, no, that's going to require a separate motion and hearing. So we would have to um, bring a separate motion requesting that it be either removed completely um, or moved to a legal location on the property. 
Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> number three, litigation, LAL construction at all, site ready versus town of Tiverton. Um, just wanted an update on discussion on the discovery. I know several of you have provided materials to the clerk, have gone, looked through your emails. And, and I just want to make it clear. Um, if it's an email that was sent to you by the clerk um, or, or by the town administrator, you don't have to provide that. If it was just an email that was coming from them to you, it happens to be listed as a scheduling or whatever, we're already disclosing that. Um, what they're looking for, and what I gather you don't have, and that's fine, but what you're required under the law to look for is if there are any other emails. If you sent something back in any way discussing it, sent something to another council member or sent something to another, uh, even to a, a private individual about it, that's what we're looking for. Now, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going <coughs> to disclose it to the other side. It's reviewed by our lawyers to see if it's privileged mm -hmm. and confidential, and if it is, we do something, we produce something called the privilege log, and I'll actually, we, we just submitted one a couple of days ago, I'll provide it to the council so you can see, which, which lists and said, okay, it, it kind of lists the date and who it was and to, but saying that we're asserting privilege, we're not actually giving you the document, we're just telling you what the log is of the documents that we say are privileged, and then it's up to them to try to press it before a judge if they believe they shouldn't be privileged. Do you want these printed out and brought to the printed I, I, out? I think that's the simplest way to do it rather than having a whole new cycle of emails mm -hmm. if you yeah. can print it okay. out and just provide it to the clerk. What's the time frame for this? Uh, about two weeks ago. But <laughs> I mean we're we're getting there. The the other side has not been totally prompt in providing their discovery too. They've gotten more, t they've requested and we've agreed to more time to respond to the motion. So um, hopefully within the next two weeks, if you could. Yeah, I've, I've gone through mine and I haven't found so far anything right. that was not other than okay. what I'd received. Well, that's what I was going to say. <coughs> you know, you mm -hmm. get all, a lot of the stuff for the clerk mm -hmm. saying we got the meeting coming up and so forth, that that's fine. You don't need to recopy all that. It's only if it's something that's coming from someone other than the clerk or that you've sent to someone mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, we, we've already turned over 2,000 pages of document. 2,000 documents or 2,000 pages? 2,000 <coughs> pages of documents. Um, and fortunately, the, most of the work of going through those is being done by um, Mike DeSisto and his law firm under the Interlocal Trust, so we're not having the cost of having to go through all those. Mm, that's good. Yes. It is taking a lot of office time. Yeah. Yeah. The clerk is... And Kate and mm -hmm. uh, other offices are very, and the administrator, er everybody is somewhat burdened by it. And I want to thank everybody for their cooperation and assistance. Um, well, I, I just have one question. I, I did forward some emails to that person, Jill. Yeah, right, yeah. Is that okay to just yes. forward it on rather well, than print it off? You should send it to through Nancy as well if you, if you, can easily send to Nancy what you already sent her directly because we'd like to also keep our record of what goes do okay. it so if you could send it through Nancy I'd prefer that otherwise we'll get we're, we'll probably get confused as to what went directly and what went and, okay. and it could and, be and it'll come back to you then they'll come back to you and ask you to send it again or something so for every I think it's better to send it all through Nancy okay anything else on that uh, number four, um, discussion on limits to liquor license. I, I just wanted to raise this again. Um, you already discussed it a little bit in the context of actually um, approving the liquor license. You, you have a couple of more licenses available than you have um, issued. You also ha don't have limits on the other class of licenses mm -hmm. that we don't necessarily have, might have. Um, and I just want to raise the issue a lot of the other towns that we represent, um, when a license is surrendered, whatever, usually reduce the number. They have the allowable number of license equals the number that are outstanding. So that if someone wants a new license in town, um, they have to come and convince the council first that they have to create, they have to amend the statute and create another license for issued, and then they can apply for it. So it kind of gives you a double mm -hmm. a check and balance on issuing licenses. Um, that was not what the last <coughs> council wanted, um, but I just wanted to raise it since it had come up again. Um, if you were interested in it, I can certainly do it. If not, you just leave it the way you have it. 
I'll just speak for myself. I think our intent from the previous council was to have two in abeyance, so to speak, so that if a business came into town and, and was viable, obviously, you know, we'd know that and uh, would be able to react quickly. Um, I think by dropping it down to those that are only active, I think may sometimes put us under the gun as uh, we do have a history of not uh, acting quickly sometimes. So I think this gives us a little freedom, at least for if two more businesses come into town, and that's only my opinion. Mr. President, yep. there is um, <coughs> one other issue that a reason why you might want to consider putting some limits on other type licenses. Recently, the Clerks Association has had a lot of emails going around about the Class C licenses. And it just so happens that uh, one of our full liquor licenses, in fact, the receiver for um, Buddy, uh, mm. the Buddy's the uh, new owner on that, they were talking of going, well, I'll just go to a Class C license. A Class C license only requires you can sell full liquor, but it's, it's more a bar license. You mm. just have to have a microwave so that some food is available there. We do not have any, and a lot of communities do not have any. I have them in the city, but not a lot of communities don't, so it's an issue with different clerks throughout the uh, state. We might want to consider saying you want them, you don't want them, or you want to limit those, because you could end up with a lot of these, unfortunately, restaurants that can't hold on, and they become, they can go easily to a C license. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have, um, so you need to consider that on where you want to go in those liquor licenses. Do we have to enable um, <coughs> a license if it exists already in, in the Rhode Island state statute? That's what Mr. Tate yeah. says to me. Well, There's no limits. That, that's correct. You have no limits. It's there in the state statute. So if someone comes in asking for one of those licenses, you have to consider you have it. to consider it. And okay. you could only deny it, um, you know, based if you find the operator unfit or you're have problems with concerns on the impact on the neighborhood it, but you, you have to have a specific denial based on the specific application before you okay. as opposed to if you have if you have an ordinance that says the number of those licenses is zero then they have to convince you first to amend that license number before they can even apply okay. and you have but obviously more discretion to say no we're not going to amend the license and is it in fact the Rhode Island Supreme Court not too long ago upheld um, the town of South Kingstown, which we also represent, on just that situation. I mean, that happened to be, that was a class A question in the number about maybe increase, but the, the town declined to increase the number of licenses, and um, the Supreme Court upheld the town's discretion on not increasing the number. Is there any reference to the Type C license in any of our fee schedules or any of our ordinances or anything like that? So we have to establish a, a fee for the license as well? And no, the, the fee is set by the state. Is it? Oh, okay. But in our um, ordinance where we allow so many, the only thing that we have a limit on is to say yes on the, um, on the full liquor licenses that we increased it. The um, class uh, liquor stores, the class... A. A. It's based on population. That's based on population anyway by the state. <coughs> well, but you, you have, could have you limited could have less it. Than yeah, the right. Number than mm. the state you could less. say this is all it's you want. It's just that we don't, mean, just, we just don't have any seats. We don't have, I mean, we, we don't. don't and, but we um, could. Usually when s these clerks associations start sending all this stuff around, you know, who has this, how come, what problems do you have? It's because there's issues in other communities with them as well. That's usually how I get the feedback. Okay. Aside from a Class C license, is there any other type of license, liquor license, that exists that we don't have any of here in town? Um, there are a variety of, of specialized licenses. Um, wineries. Yeah, yeah, wineries, mm -hmm. ancient taverns. Ancient, ancient taverns. Ancient, yeah, ancient taverns, yeah, that's where the White Horse Tavern mm -hmm. is they're right next to a church, otherwise it wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. There's ancient cover, oh, there's okay. ancient comfort stations, which is the restaurant that used to be a comfort station downtown in mm -hmm. Providence. I like the sound um, of that. <laughs> so there is a list. Well, I, I just asked because it sounded like a Class C license <coughs> might bring with it certain... That, that's, that's issues right that's the one that's most likely to have the issues and most likely to be applied for it's just a plain bar it's, 
selling alcohol and, you know, uh, the famous pickled eggs, pickled eggs. And <laughs> no. I mean, I suppose you could, you could, is it mostly just bar rooms or is it other things like wine bars and, you know, martini lounges and... Well, if they're not serving food, that's right. what they would come okay. in yeah. with Class yeah. C. Okay. And, and it, 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 you know, it can depend. Sometimes it is just your old, yeah. you know, neighborhood bar, and yeah. you know they're serving beer and boiler makers. And other times it might be a martini okay. thing. Um, there, I, I do believe there's someone who's trying to set up a separate license for wine bars separately, but it did not pass the general assembly. Okay. Um, so, to circle back to what uh, the limits on. Uh, BV is it BV? BV. Yeah. I think I will echo what what Ed has said. I think um, putting the responsibility on someone who may be new to town and wanting to open up a restaurant or some other such establishment to come and get approval is just another one of those roadblocks to. It's one of those um, those things like we don't know they're not. It, you know that they're they're making the decision before they get to to us, so we we, we don't want to discourage people from coming. Period. Um, and if they know that there's a possibility that they're not not only not going to get awarded a liquor or have the opportunity to get a liquor license, not not be awarded, they have to prove to us twice that they're uh, that they're uh, worthy of of consideration. Um, so I'm I'm not concerned with the way it is right now, but. Um, Certainly, would be interested to see if there was a consensus among other people in other communities. Or is this a, is this a problem? It isn't a problem. I'm just telling you okay. that you have no limits on the others. As far as the full liquor license, that's fine. We have some, and we still have some extra if businesses mm -hmm. come in, and they could always do as Susan's restaurant did, come in and ask you to extend it further. You cannot extend the um, package stores any further because no. that's by population. No. You don't have the ability to do that. And that full liquor license is the only other one that you have limits on. So anything else you have no limits on and by them being uh, they are state licenses you can have those liquor licenses. The Class C is the one that concerns me the most because I keep hearing it coming up. Uh, you know well, we won't, we'll take out the kitchen. We're not going to have a kitchen anymore. We're just going to have a microwave and serve liquor. Well, you've changed your, you're no longer that restaurant. You're just a bar now. Okay. Um, so be it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Nancy, uh, could you, for not our next meeting, but the meeting after, uh, just get a brief synopsis from our sister towns who have C licenses yes. and the issues that, that they have and, and whether or not they, you know, whether they have a limit. And I'm mm -hmm. sure there are towns that are similar to us, you know, how many do they have, you know, are they grandf you know, are they grandfathered, are they ones that have been forever, or are they new, you know, just so, because I, I, I think it's a good point, something that we should look into. And since it's not really high priority, I will try to, it probably won't make the next meeting, but the one Yeah, that's okay. yeah. Really I just have one last question. Uh, Andy, is, has there been any discussion at the state of, of altering that uh, liquor stores by population calculation not seems like an unreasonably heard, no. Puritan uh, mechanism, but okay. No, I'm, I haven't heard about it. Okay. okay. Uh, town clerk. Okay, you have a copy of the agenda. It's just mm -hmm. as a reminder that you, uh, Thursday evening is a joint workshop with the budget committee and the school committee at the uh, Tiverton High School library i won't be attending that but leona will be there it's likely i'm just giving everyone a, f a heads up it's likely i would be late to that <coughs> okay um jim will you be providing us with uh, any updates on the budgets uh nothing more than was previously indicated at this point <laughs> i don't know if you need me to repeat it or um uh, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I, th I think if you could uh, just do a cursory budget uh, with uh, only contractual increase and see what that looks like. Has, has the budget committee 
um, issued any sort of agenda or spoken about anything specific that they would like to cover at this joint workshop? All our agendas are the same, I believe. It's just the discussion of the 2013. Okay, so just more general. And mm -hmm. the, yes, okay. they're all the same. Have they met since our, our um, no. joint meeting? Because they're not technically no. in yeah, session. They're, yeah, they're, they're not whatever. active yet. Okay. Yeah. I think this is to get, because the school department wasn't able to get in there in the kind of oh, right, right. agreement. Okay. And Councilor Dean Medeiros will not be able to make that. She's working. She's informing me tonight that she's okay. working through and then secondly, uh, Kate has asked that um, you schedule a joint workshop with the planning board on the um, form-based code that, and it's an 80-page document, so she's going to get it to us early enough um, so I can distribute it to the council with their next packet. Uh, she'd like it videoed, and they're requesting Tuesday, November 19th, if that is an available date. Yeah. The council, Tuesday, November nineteenth. Tuesday, November nineteenth. Yes. Tuesday. Yes. So far into the future, it might as well be next year. I believe the Cecil group will be here. Yeah. Here. Yes. Yes, I believe so. At presumably seven. If your agreement to the date with our next meeting, we'll, um, you know, I'll have a draft agenda for you I don't have anything on my calendar but that doesn't uh, Nancy that's not tied to the main road those four corners is that what we're talking about here the base form code yes yes main okay. road and yeah. yes okay great the thank Cecil you. group we had mm -hmm. one yep. public hearing on it yes it's just thank you so the plan board's requesting they I guess they've come to some Conclusions are okay. requesting a workshop. Okay. Is that okay with everyone? Uh, so far. Okay. Until it becomes not okay, it's okay. Right. <laughs> okay. That's it. That's it for me. You are available, right. Mr. Tights? I'm available on the 19th, yep. <coughs> that's that's their regular planning board meeting, so they get everybody yeah. together. It would likely be here? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Who will I pick on? Me. <laughs> I'll make a motion uh, to enter into closed executive session pursuant to Gen Rhode Island General Law 4246-5A1, performance per personnel performance, Thomas Blakey, police chief, notice has been given. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? All right. Continuing in um, closed executive session pursuant to Rhode Island General Law 4246-5A1, personnel performance, Gareth Ames, code enforcement officer, notice given. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Continuing closed executive session in accordance with Rhode Island general law, 4246-5A2, uh, litigation report. Second. We have a motion and second. All those in favor? Continuing in closed executive session, Pursuant to Rhode Island General Law 4246-5A2, litigation, Tividen versus Datsun Mobile Homeowners Association. Second.